kind of curious. My kids are, are you know, mostly grown up now, you know, the, in high school or, or older. Um, those with kids still young, do they still do track and field day? Yes. Yes? Anyone else with me? That was like the highlight of the year. A few of you? Nobody. One, I see that hand in the back. All right. Uh, for me, it was the absolute, like one of the absolute highlights of the year. I love track and field day. I know for some people it was like, don't even send me to school that day. I'm not going to win anything. It's just the worst experience. But for me, I loved it because I was actually pretty fast. Believe it or not, um, I was actually pretty fast when I was little. And uh, my thing was the 100 meter dash. I would, I would often win the 100 meter dash and then go on to the next. I wouldn't go to the regionals. I wouldn't go to the next level beyond that because there's always somebody faster than me, but in my school, I was known as one of the fastest kids. Until one year, in one of the, the races leading up to the, the finals, I was beside a guy who ran like this, and I caught an elbow in the throat, and that took me out of the race. Not that I'm bitter or anything, you know. I'm going I'm to get to heaven, and God's going to hug me and say, it's not your fault. It's not your fault. All about this 100-meter dash. Um, so I wasn't going to go to the, the next level. I wasn't going to go to the, the track and field day, you know, whatever the, the regional thing was. And so one of the teachers said to me, what about the 1500? And I was like, I don't even know, what, there's a number that high? Like, what is the 1500? I don't even know what that is. And, you know, I'm a sprinter, but he was saying, but no one else has signed up for the 1500 and, and we can send somebody. We've got a place on the bus. Do you want to, do you want to try it? And I was like, is it a day off school? Then sure, sign me up. You know, I, I will do the 1500. And my entire training regimen for the 1500 meter was one time my coach sort of said, okay, go. And I ran around the track. It was like two laps around the big track. Uh, and he said, okay, we're good to go. And I was like, all right. And so I, uh, I got to, you know, the, the track and field day. You might think that with that kind of training, I would be the absolute worst runner in the race. But you might be surprised to find out I was not the worst runner. I was the second worst runner. <laughs> and my problem, I think, I, with a little bit more training and a little bit more planning, I think I probably could have done well. Uh, but I, I paced myself, you know, and, and the, the pack started getting a little bit ahead of me. And I'm like, it's okay, it's a long race, you know, 1,500 whole meters. You got a little bit further away, I'm like, it's, it's like a marathon, it's not a sprint. You got to pace myself. And so I'm running at my pace, and they're getting further and further ahead. And about the time I finished the first lap, I realized they were like a half lap ahead. And there was just, there was very little chance I was going to catch up. And so second lap, I sprinted all out. I went as hard as I could, and I crossed the line right in front of the last place guy. And I was like, I'm not going to be last. The problem is, I, I didn't start with the end in mind. Stephen Covey in uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People talks about beginning with the end in mind. He says, whatever your task is, begin with a clear vision of your desired direction and destination, and then continue by flexing your proactive muscles to make things happen. How many of us do this in our lives? I, I know this is something I need to work on. I know, I know I'm, my wife is sitting there looking at me thinking, you need to do this. Don't preach about it. Do it. How many of us have a clear vision of the end result we want? in a lot of different areas of our, of our lives. How many of us just start running and hope for the best? Problem is, if we don't run with the race with the end in mind, we're subject to what's called the tyranny of the urgent in our lives. There's always something that's going to want your attention. There's always something that's going to pop up. And if you don't have a goal set and a plan to fulfill that goal, and, and if you're not running your race with the end in mind, then whatever pops up is going to be like, no, pay attention to me right now. This is what you need to do. And you will focus on whatever seems urgent at the moment. And again, I know this is something I need to get better at. Uh, I need to do better at setting goals in my life so that the urgent doesn't rule. But I would also argue that for too many people, the goals they set can actually hurt them in the long run. I'm not, I'm not saying I'm anti-goal. I'm just saying make sure your goals are the right goals. Setting goals is great if you're setting the right goals. So we're partway through a series called Role Model. We took, we took one week last week to do a baptism, um, but uh, we're, we're in the middle of this series on, on 1 Timothy. 
role model is living a life that is representative of the way God wants us to act. I mean, you can be a role model in a lot of different things, but when we're talking about role model in the church, we're talking about the book of 1 Timothy, where Paul wrote to his protege and said, this is how I want you to lead. This is how I want you to act, and this is how I want you to teach those in your church to act, so they can then teach others how to act. It's kind of like a domino effect. You learn how to live your life to teach others so that they can teach others. If you want to be a role model, you need to focus on what is eternal. If you want to be a role model, you need to focus on what is eternal. And this is, this is not a brand new idea. I know I've preached on this idea before. But the reason I sometimes repeat things is because it's really important. If you want to be a role model, focus on what is eternal. Too many people are too focused on goals that won't make any difference 100 years from now. I mean, I'm not saying it's bad to think about your finances or your, you know, your, your retirement plan, but what happens after that? I'd actually say it's a good thing to think about those things, but what happens after your retirement? What happens for eternity? I mean, you wouldn't want to go through life putting all your effort into what's going to happen now and ignore what happens after that. Because our life is like this, and eternity is a little bit bigger. So talking about a role model, I mentioned that, that Paul wrote this to his protege, Timothy. Timothy was given a tough challenge. Timothy was called to be the church leader in Ephesus. And Ephesus was a, a, a Greek city that um, had, had issues. I mean, every, every church is going to have issues, but they had some specific issues. And it was probably written around 63 AD. This is about 30 years after Jesus' death and resurrection. And there were people in the church that wanted to take the message that, that Paul had given them. Paul planted the church, and he said, you know, the focus needs to be on Jesus. And they wanted to take the focus and put it somewhere else. And so Paul was saying to Timothy, you know what, you, you've got you to gotta bring people back in line. If you want to be a role model, focus on the right things. That was our first week. That's what we talked about. And the second week we talked about if you want to be a role model, you need to play the role that God has given you. Like it's, it's, it's not just enough to be able to focus on the right things, but you need to do the right things as well. We talked about it not being about value, but about order. And God's given us an order. The week after that, I wasn't here, my dad spoke. He spoke about uh, what it means to be the household of faith and, and the truths of our faith. Talked about elders and deacons and, and the things that we believe. The neat thing about that chapter, though, is that it ends with the carnation, incarnation. Uh, there's a verse there that says, Without question, this is the great mystery of our faith. Christ was revealed to us in a human body and vindicated by the Spirit. So you've got Paul saying, you know, make sure you focus on the right things. What is the right thing? It's Jesus. All my faith is rooted in Jesus. Faith is all about Jesus. And, and Paul's just saying, no matter what, what area they want to focus on, and there's, and there's lots of different things that we could, that could draw our attention away, but he's saying, just bring it back to Jesus. Always bring it back to Jesus. I mean, that, that is the key to, to being a Christian. And so today we come to 1 Timothy chapter 4. It says, Now the Holy Spirit tells us clearly that in the last times some will turn away from the true faith. So, you know, focus on Jesus. This is the way you're supposed to live. But understand that in the last days, some will turn away from the truth. And, you know, Kathy and I were talking earlier this week about the last days. Like, when, when are the last days? Well, the truth is we're already in the last days. Like, the last, and, and I don't mean like it started in 2000 or 1988 or whatever day you want to pick. Uh, I believe the last days started when Christ rose from the dead. Like, the last days are not a number of years, but it's more of an era. It's a broad understanding of what the last days are. But the truth is, some will turn away from the true faith. Which is pretty depressing. I mean, it's not, it's not the message that you want to be able to, to preach. You, you, I wish I could stay up here and say, you know, hey, no one will ever turn away from the true faith, and no one's ever going to believe something that's not true. But that's not what the Bible teaches us. He goes on, he says, They will follow deceptive spirits and teachings that come from demons. 
So understand it this way. Uh, Satan has already lost. You know, there's, there's a battle that's going to come, but Satan has already lost. And all he wants to do now is bring as many people down with him as possible. And so he's going to teach, uh, through different means, he's going to teach things that aren't true. You know, focus on Jesus, but, but what about this idea? I mean, whatever that idea is, it's going to take our focus off of Jesus. And some people in the last days will turn away from the true faith. Follow deceptive spirits and teachings that come from demons. These people, and I think here he's talking about those who, who try to teach these things, these people are hypocrites and liars, and their consciences are dead. The word dead there is, is like almost like burned. If you think about it, like, like um, almost like you've lost feeling. Like, like you burned your, your, your hand so bad that you can no longer feel what's, what's happening. That's what's happening in people's consciences. That they're so, their hearts are so callous, they're so burnt, they're so dead, that they can't even tell the difference of, of what they're doing being right or wrong. The wolves in sheep's clothing. This is interesting. It says, uh, they will say that it is wrong to be married and wrong to eat certain foods. Now that was you know, very specific to what's happening in the church in Ephesus. And it doesn't, I mean, in some ways you can just say they'll teach you wrong things. It doesn't really matter what those things are. But ultimately, it's about trying to earn your salvation. And this is an idea that comes up again and again and again, whether it's in Ephesus or in Galatia or Pembroke. You know, there's always going to people, be people who want to say, this is how you get saved. It's about the things that you do. And if you perform well enough, then you get to go to heaven. But what does Paul teach Timothy? Bring them back to what? Jesus. Bring them back to the cross. Always bring your focus on what really matters, and what really matters is Jesus. And so it's not about whether you marry or, or whether you marry or not marry. It's not about what you eat or not eat. I mean, we have we have freedom in Christ, and I'm, I'm thankful for that. But my salvation is not based on what I can do. Don't get me wrong. There's there's ways we should act. There's things we're supposed to do. But that's not what saves me. My performance isn't isn't going to matter when I get to heaven. It's, it's, am I saved by the blood of Jesus who died for my sins? I mean, that's the entire key right there. And so these, these other debates are just a waste of time. Now, I find it interesting that they talk about uh, marriage and, and eating foods. Like, if, we were to, if you were to write this to us in the church today, it would be very different. It wouldn't be about not getting married. It would be about who you marry and, and, and that kind of thing. But all that to say that every church is going to have their own issues. Every, every era is going to have their own issues. There's always going to be some hot topic that's going to try and draw us further and further and further away from Jesus. And Paul is telling Timothy, bring it back to focus on the right thing. Now talking about food, he said, God created those foods to be eaten with thanks by, by faithful people who know the truth. See, I don't, I don't know the exact facts of the, the case here. My guess is it's probably people who, um, what Paul refers to as Judaizers in other passages, and saying, you know, you're not allowed to eat certain meats because that's what Moses told us back in the day, ignoring the fact that, that Jesus says we're no longer under that law. But God created those foods to be eaten with thanks by faithful people who know the truth. I mean, certain times people weren't allowed to eat pigs, but God made those pigs, and I don't know about you, I think they taste pretty good. Since everything God created is good, we should not reject any of it, but receive it with thanks. For we know it is made acceptable by the word of God and prayer. All right, so it, it's like God is saying that, that through, through Paul to Timothy, to tell the rest of us, God made this, so don't take it off the table. We might talk about how much of it we eat, but that's a different story. If you explain these things to the brothers and sisters, Timothy, you will be a worthy servant of Christ Jesus, one who is nourished by the message of faith and good teaching you have followed. So again, you know, I'm teaching you to live this way so that you can teach others, but you need to be nourished. What did Jesus say? Not by bread alone, but by the word of God. You need to be nourished by the message of faith, the good teaching you have followed. That is the kind of thing that's going to allow you to live the kind of life that, that I want you to live. 
not so that you can be saved, but, but because you are saved. Do not waste time arguing over godless ideas or old wives' tales. Instead, train yourself to be godly. Again, it's kind of like he's saying marriage, food, doesn't matter. I mean, whatever the argument is, if it's, if it's those things or something else, don't waste your time on those ideas. Don't waste your time on old wives' tales. Don't waste your time on, on whatever the, the demonic ideas are that try to draw you, away, draw you away from Jesus. Train yourself to be godly. That is the goal of a Christian. Again, not to be saved, but because you are saved. You want to act the way God wants you to act. Physical training is good, but training for godliness is much better. Promising benefits in this life and in the life to come. I think that's a huge part of it right there. Right there. I mean, if it was only for this life, then you could throw all this out. I mean, other parts of the Bible, it says, you know, if, 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 if this life is all there is, then Christians are to be pitied more than anybody else because we're absolutely wasting our time with this. But if there is an eternity, and the options on the table are an eternity with God or an eternity without God, and this is hugely important. I mean, you could work yourself to the bone. You could be in peak physical shape, almost like I am. But what happens when you die? Has anyone seen a good-looking corpse? Like, train for godliness is much better. Promising benefits in this life and in the life to come. This is a trustworthy saying, trustworthy saying, and everyone should accept it. I'm almost tempted to put that on this on outside the gym, down. You know, hey, this is good, but there's something better. This is why we work hard and continue to struggle, for our hope is in the living God, who is the Savior of all people and particularly of all believers. So again, it's not what you do, it's not what you eat, it's not the things you you even believe or say. It's it's do you put your faith in Jesus? He is our hope. He is the living God. He died, came back to life, was resurrected. He's alive, and our hope is in him. If my hope is in me, I'm out of luck. If your hope is in you, you're out of luck. But our hope is in the living God, Jesus Christ. And I love this quote from C.S. Lewis, from Mere Christianity. If you aim at heaven, you get earth thrown in. Aim at earth, and you'll get neither. This is going back to this idea of like, do you want to live for now and today, or do you want to live for eternity? Because if you choose to follow Jesus and live for eternity, you get this life thrown in. You get the joyful, full, abundant life that God wants you to have here and now. But if you only focus on this world, you're actually not going to get the things that God wants you to have. Not now and not later. So Timothy, teach these things, and I would say that also then goes to Rob, teach these things, and I would also say that goes to you, teach these things, because we are all called to be leaders to the next generation of faith. Teach these things, and, and the next generation, I don't mean necessarily your children, it could be your neighbor or your coworker, right? Like, these are the people who you're going to share your faith with. Teach these things and insist that everyone learn them. Don't let anyone think less of you because you're young. Be an example to all believers in what you say, in the way you live, in your love, your faith, and your purity. That was our verse of the month last month. This is, this is the way we're supposed to act. Again, not so you can be saved, but because you are saved. This is what God wants us to do. Be an example to all believers. Until I get there, focus on reading the scriptures to the church, encouraging the believers, and teaching them. Like, you've been given a tough task, Timothy, and there's people who are going to try to, to draw you off, but you know what? Just focus on God's word. Focus on the scriptures. Encourage the believers. Teach them. Teach them what? Teach them God's word. Teach them the truth. I will come and I'll, I'll maybe share some doctrine eventually, but focus on the word of God. You cannot go wrong if you do that. Do not neglect the spiritual gift you received through the prophecy spoken over you when the elders of the church laid their hands on you. So just the way that we laid our hands on the, the new members this morning, uh, there was a time when Timothy was, was called to come and be a pastor of Ephesus. And the, the leaders of the church laid their hands on Timothy and basically kind of like put a mantle of leadership on him and prayed for him and said, go and do it and be an example. And now Paul is saying, this is how you do it. 
Give your complete attention to these matters. Throw yourself into your tasks so that everyone will see your progress. Keep a close watch on how you live and on your teaching. And, and again, I want to come back to this idea. It's, it's not do this so that you can be saved, but, but um, because you are saved, because other people are looking at you. We don't, we don't live out our faith because of what other people are seeing, but we do recognize that other people are going to see us. And we need to recognize that some people will only know Jesus because of the way you act. We mentioned that a few weeks ago. Keep a close watch on how you live and on your teaching. Stay true to what is right for the sake of your own salvation and the salvation of those who hear you. In other words, he's sort of saying, you are saved. So because of that, live a certain way. And other people are going to look to you. And sometimes, depending on the way you live, might determine whether or not they get saved. It is a huge, important calling to anyone who's called to be a leader. But I would extrapolate from that, it's a huge calling for anyone who's called to the Great Commission, which is all of us. When you agree to become a follower of Jesus, you are saying, I'm going to be an example to others. I'm going to make disciples and and show them what it means to be a Christian. And so we need to focus on what is eternal. If you're going to spend the rest of your existence in God's kingdom, why not start now? I think sometimes we have this idea that we're going to wait for someday to live the kind of life that God wants us to live in heaven. But I think Paul is saying here, start now. Start living like you're in heaven right now. Like, like do the things that you will do in heaven right now. Train in godliness so that you can run the race that God wants you to. Again, if I'd, if I'd had a little bit more training, if I had understood how to run the longer race when I was a little kid, I probably would have done better. God wants us to, to train now so that we can run the race he wants us to. How do we do that? I mean, you spend time with, with God. You spend time in your word. Maybe you sign up for our Matthew reading for the next month. Like you, you, you spend time thinking about God's word, meditating on God's word, not emptying your mind of everything, but focusing your mind on what God wants you to learn. That's what biblical medica- meditation is. Maybe you join a small group. You know, there's an opportunity to, to, to sign up for one this morning. It's an opportunity to, to connect with other Christians and sort of bounce ideas off each other and say, it's not, it's not just my understanding of God's word, but you know, a, a bigger church-wide understanding of what God's really trying to teach us. It keeps us on the right track. Jesus talked to us about a full and abundant life. And this is how we do it. We connect ourselves to him and live our lives with purpose. I mean, think about the, the passage where, where Jesus talked about being the vine and the branches, right? Like, you can't do anything on your own. You can only do it when you are connected to Jesus. That is a full and abundant life. Connect yourself to him. Live the life that he wants you to. Produce the fruit that he wants you to produce. We start living for eternity today because that's how you become a role model. I'll invite our worship team to come back up.